There'll be a reason for this. We'll be looking from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. And there's something significant in here. It's talking about revival. And the people stood to hear the word of God. And there is something in that standing, and that's the purpose of that this morning. So follow along. We'll be looking at Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who can understand. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mataniah, and Shemaiah, and Ananiah, and Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Melchijah, Hashem, Hashabadiah, Zechariah, and Meshuzalem. On his left... And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshiah, Benaiah, Sherebiah, Jakim, Akarab, Shabbatai, Hodai, Masanai, Kejatai, Azari, Jobad, Hanai, Peliah, the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah, who was with the governor and the Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the Lord... Uh, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. You may be seated. Let us pray together. Father, that our hearts would be aflame to your holy word, that we would see the joy that is found therein, and may this be a time of celebration. Although there may be a a season for mourning, of weeping, of grieving, yet even through difficulties, we will see that you are with us, that you are our strength, that you are our God, that our hearts would be turned unto you, that we would with one voice and one people to your word say amen and amen. This is true. You are our God. We are your people. And in Christ, we have this privilege as your people and say amen and amen. This week, a group of people, a very misfit group of people, as some would describe, calling themselves a a bunch of names, uh, Extinction Rebellion, Animal Liberation, Anti-Bank Protesters, Anarchists, and a whole mishmash of folks gathered in downtown Toronto at King and Bay Streets and tried to disrupt the events as much as possible. One commentator noting the irony that instead of having the flow of public transit, 
it was disrupted, so a whole bunch of people had to hail Ubers and taxis and other cars in order to get where they wanted to go. But in their protests, they were talking about what they saw as an emergency, as an ecological disaster. And of course, this isn't indicative of just Bay Street in Toronto. There are discussions at the United Nations. There are protests around the world from uh, Australia uh, to uh, Finland and everywhere in between of people seeing this and having a upswell in attention through the broader public. But this is not the same way of what happens when God moves among a people. This phenomenon, known biblically, is revival. And its particular qualities can be discerned not only from Scripture, but seeing the effects that have gone on even from the, the closing of the canon of Scripture in a genuine moving among God's people. There are a lot of other examples in Scripture. We see Israel experience in 2 Chronicles 14 and 15 under Asa, and then Hezekiah in verses 29 and 31, and Josiah in 2 Chronicles 34 and 35, and on and on and on. But what you see here which is indicative of every true revival, is an understanding and appreciating of the Word of God, and through that, understanding who the God of the Word is. When the prophet Isaiah, recorded in Isaiah chapter 6, came to have his eyes open and see the glory of God, recognizing who he was, and falling before this holy God, when you see it move among a group of people, it is a, an appreciation like never before of the holiness of God, of our utter depravity and need for Him, and the glory that He works in redeeming His people. It not only is an intellectual change of understanding, but it is a heart moving that can change countries. People have looked at elements as the, the celebration of Reformation Day, October 31st, through the Reformation of the 16th century. They could see it moving through regions like England and Ireland and the, the great Welsh revival. They can see it in, in places like many people say what's happening in regions like China now. Even amongst the fiercest persecution, something that governments can't stop. When a people will say, take my life, but my life has already been taken by Christ. And will put their lives for the sake of the gospel of Christ. You see, when a people come confronted with the reality of God in his word, as we're seeing here in Nehemiah 8, they're changed. Their whole lives are changed. And they become change agents, not revolutionaries, they come as liberators. They come through the liberation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see, through the, the people of Nehemiah here, has, as there has been the rebuilding of the, the physical infrastructure of the people, there is now going to be a rebuilding of the heart infrastructure of the people. And recognizing even beyond the security of the physical buildings is the security of their God. This is a season of celebration amongst the people of God in what seems to be lost in, in coming to an, a new and fresh understanding of the Word of God changing the heart of a people. And what is being presented here in, in Nehemiah in recovering that Word, he's going to show how it's changing the people and it can change us. And he's showing it through three things. First, through the communication in the first six verses, the clarification in verses 7 and 8, and in the celebration of that in verses 9 through 12. So seeing this season of celebration of a revival amongst God's people, first it happened through the communication in the first six verses, and we'll spend most of our time on this. So at this particular time in history, Nehemiah 8.1 notes that the people were gathering together. And it almost seems 
very close to a traditional synagogue service where you'd have the assembly of the people, request for the reading of the Torah, opening of the scrolls, the people standing, the praise, the response of the people, the sermon instruction, the reading of the law, the oral examination and exhortation and their departure for a fellowship meal. So this is much like a, a synagogue celebration en masse amongst a, a group of people. That's why our text says they gathered as one man in the square before the water gate. See, their, their worship extended beyond the walls of a physical space to worship. And this is what revival hits a people when they live lives of worship, not just coming together to worship. And they come here to the water gate, alluding to the, the cleansing, the refreshing, the reviving power of the Word of God. Much like a, a people that are, are parched, are thirsty, that they are quenched, they are refreshed from hearing and experiencing the Word of God. And the response to the people's request, Ezra brought the book of the law. As he had set to study, to proclaim that, and most likely, although our, our text says a book, it was most likely a scroll. And it would have been read at least every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles. And even though it had been neglected up to this point because these were people just coming out of a Babylonian captivity, they're coming to an un understanding afresh of the Word. And we have the first mention here of Ezra the scribe of the book of Nehemiah. It's not mentioned earlier at this point, but as they had struggled to rebuild the wall, so now we see the, the scribal role come back into play. And verse 2 says he was also a priest. So for 13 years he had his leadership rejected. You could imagine that, well, we have a wall to build here. We have, we have a temple to build. We have a city to build. We'll get to that, that, that God thing that you have for us later, Ezra. And they realized that even though they had rebuilt all this, the strongest wall, the grandest cathedral is nothing when the Word of God is absent. And this is what is changing the people here. Look at the audience. All who could understand what they had heard, all, or all that could hear with understanding. This is what the Word of God is. It's not something merely for a, a certain age bracket, but it changes the those of the earliest age to the later in years. And, and they come here with a sense of expectation of what's going to happen. See, biblical faith is not just sitting here learning other things, learning names, learning facts, learning figures like a, like a history lesson. This is not what's being presented here. It's showing the Word of God moving through a people and moving a people, and it's the same thing that would touch our hearts and direct us here. It's not just the, the, quality, uh, the quantity of this learning here. There, it's been said people have uh, some knowledge that's a mile wide and an inch deep. They've just, they, yeah, they can even recount all the stories and they, all, and they know all the facts and, and what's going on. But has this penetrated the heart? Has this changed the mind? Is it impacting in the steps? This is what's going on here for the people of God. They've gathered on the first day of the seventh month. It was the seventh month of Tishri, about 445 B.C., and as uh, Nehemiah 8.3 says that Ezra read from the book of the law. Some have speculated this might have been all of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We don't know for sure. He, this could have been as long as a six-hour service. Notice how it says from early morning till midday. You're up for that today, aren't you? you got, we, we have food coming in later. <laughs> But he says he read from it. It doesn't necessarily mean that he read the totality of it. Most likely he read portions of it and there was a pause of explanation that they may come to understanding. And this is the challenge of our day. We're no longer an oral culture. It used to be that you would gather together to hear accounts of things, that people would impart their wisdom, that you would discuss things, and you would, you would glean wisdom hearing for others. Now we tend to have 
I was going to say a little box. They're no longer little boxes, a flat screen. And we tend to be a visual culture or an auditory culture, uh, but not an oral culture. It, we find it very difficult to go through extended passages of Scripture to our detriment. You see, notice how the, the people responded to the word. The ears of all the people were attentive. And this is the necessity for revival. Not just knowledge, not just activity, but when we are each and every one of us truly attentive to the word, what does this say? What does this mean? What should I do? When we each ask this question, this is what happens with the revival of a people. You want to know how you can tell true revival from revivalism? Revivalism is a drawing up first of emotions and excitement. And people get excited about things. Manipulating music, manipulating lighting, manipulating the presentation. Draw up the excitement with people. But what happens? You can look in... Uh, the revivalism of northern New York, where there was all kinds of tent meetings, but it amounted to nothing. Why? Because the Word of God was absent. It wasn't focused primarily on the Word of God changing the people. That's why the starting point of worship and a revival from the people has to start with the Word of God. If you start first with the emotions, it'll crowd out the Word, and the first sign of difficulty or confusion, you won't know what to do. But when you are grounded on the Word and the God of the Word, then you have a steady rock to build your faith and a sure direction to move forward. And even hell itself can't conquer somebody who is grounded in the Word. Notice verse 4. In order to be seen and heard, Nehemiah 8.4 specifies that Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform or a pulpit of wood. This was in order to be heard by the people, a position of, of elevation that they could, everyone could hear that, that they would come to an understanding. But do you notice how it's all the people gathered here? And this is, this is the difference when private worship happens and public revival. This platform here is in a public place. If there's anything that I lament about what's indicative of Canada right now, is that there is no platform publicly for people of faith anymore. They are shut out of the political process. You'll be a pariah. They're shut out of the business discussions publicly. They're shut out of the social welfare care. They're show, they're, they're sh left out of any kind of public gathering or event. Pro doesn't matter whether even it's after a, a tragedy where people would pride themselves, well, at least it wasn't made religious. Yeah, you took the only comfort and the, the only solace moving forward out of them. Congratulations. We need to be careful on this. But we need to, mark my words, fight to bring God back into the public square. I'm not saying placards and bullhorns and, and things like that. This is going to happen the same way it happened here. Bringing God's word back into the equation. How does God have something to say about political life? He's got something to say. Does he have something to say about how we operate our schools? how we operate social welfare agencies, how we care for the poor. Even just to remind folks that every hospital, every children's aid society, every school, every social welfare agency, where do you think that came from? A people moved by the word of God showing compassion for people. But now there is a drive, and unfortunately the church has taken it sitting down. Faith is a private thing. You can believe what you want, just, just off at the side, just, just keep it quiet. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the faith <laughs> that changes the world. The faith that changes the world is the faith that lives out its life in the public sphere unashamedly. 
How can you show compassion to somebody that the world rejects? Jesus Christ. How can you continue to minister to somebody when you can get nothing tangibly, physically in return? Jesus Christ. How can you care for people that are difficult, that do not want to learn, that will fight you even for it? Jesus Christ. When we put Christ back into the, <laughs> the message and the motive and the means of what we are doing, then Christ impacts our public sphere. Nehemiah 8, 6, as Ezra is reading from this and praising the Lord, Ezra, bless the Lord, the great God. You see, this is, this is the first place to start in our lives before we seek to be impacting the public sphere. Revival comes from a praying people. This is what is reflected here in Ezra blessing the Lord. He's, he's offering the prayers of the people back unto the Lord. Nothing ever has been achieved in all of biblical history apart from God's people praying. It doesn't matter how much financial resources you have, how slick your marketing is, how many people you have, how diligent you work. We are only as effective as our prayers, or as one author says, we will only rise to the level of our prayer lives. If our ministry is shallow, it's because our prayers are shallow. If our marriages are shallow, it's because our prayers are shallow. If our witnessing is shallow, it's because our prayers are shallow. And that's why there is the response of the people in thanksgiving to this prayer. Amen and amen. What are they doing? They are coming together corporately to pray along with Ezra. It's not just something that Ezra as the priest does for the people. It's the people coming together and affirming and praying together. Yes, you can pray for someone else, but there is something else when people pray together unto God. This is corporate prayer and thanksgiving and praising God. And all the people responded, a unified togetherness and unity with one heart and one voice. The people responded by lifting up their hands in worship. And what are they doing? They're showing their communal need by saying, amen, amen. This is true. We need you, God. We're submitting to your word. And they bowed their heads in humility and submission before God. What does this look like? Turn, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You see, instead of self-congratulation in worship, I'm so, God, I'm so great, you're so great, we're all so great, haven't we done great things? <laughs> True worship is proclaiming the greatness of God. And we are a people that need Him. And He can do great things through us. But it starts with God. This is how... Paul explained it to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, starting at verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, I am the, telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger, or quarreling. How do, you, how do you change the public life for kings and those in authorities, verse 2? You pray for them. We have an election tomorrow. Maybe the person you want to get in might get in, might not. But how do you really change Canada? How do you really change Ontario or Pickering or Ajax or Whitby, etc.? How do you really change that? 
You pray for your leaders. And you know the hardest prayers? The hardest prayers are for the ones that don't hold your viewpoints. Because we become very tribalistic in Canada. Well, I identify as this, and I only associate with those people. But can we actually show our love to those who are nothing like us, either politically or socially, economically, intellectually? This, this is what it means in, in that supplication, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving. Can, can we, instead of thinking of what we don't have, can we thank God for the blessings that we do have in this country? Can we intercede for our leaders, especially those we disagree with? Can we seek those prayers and supplications that God would be honored through it? Are we supposed to do this through revolution and rioting? What does our text say in verse 2? That we might lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified. We should be the best citizens ever. We should participate. We should make our voices known. But we should do so in a way that is peaceful, godly, and dignified. In essence, a, a quiet life. We're not called to be those revolutionaries. It's the Word of God that brings about the revolution. Not our loudness and our brashness. That often closes the door. The people will not listen to the Word. This, when we can express this in unity, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. When we are a unified people, unified not on the externals, but on the Word of God. This is what it means to be a people of revival. <laughs> there was a story of a gentleman named Heinrich Henke, a German poet, who was standing before the Cathedral of Armain in France, and his friend asked him, looking up at this grand cathedral, why can't people build churches like this anymore? And Heinrich responded to his friends, in those days people had convictions. We moderns have opinions. And it takes much more than an opinion to build a Gothic cathedral. As we are moving forward as a congregation... It's more than just opinions on the sidelines that will build the ministry here of Safe Haven. It is a people that make their voices known, first seeking God's will from His Word. And it's not to build some sort of grand edifice somewhere to think that, look, look at the great thing we could build. Unless the building comes first in here, the building out there does not matter. And this is where the revival happens. Yes, we want to make ourselves known and to be seen. But the building first has to start in here, in a revival in our hearts, before we even think of a shovel in the ground or any other activity. Now second, in this season of celebration, more quickly, revival coming upon a people seen through the clarification in verses 7 and 8. All the people mentioned in verse 7 are, are Levites, for it says the Levites help the people to understand the law. And this is the key on this. It's not just coming to know more information, but it's also helping the people understand the law. 1 Corinthians 2 talks about the Word of God being foolishness to the world because it must be spiritually discerned. Hopefully, you would see yourself from 1 Peter as being part of the priesthood of God, like these Levites, bringing the meaning, the understanding to the people. It's everything in the public media will mock the things of God. Every character. Who, who's, who's the nut on any television show? It's the religious person, isn't it? Who's the person most likely to do the most horrific things or be the, the most out of touch? It's the religious nut. But can we show that the Word of God impacts us? And can we first, we have to first have that understanding. Can we bring that understanding and articulate it clearly to a world that lacks that understanding? Used to be a time there used to be 
a common understanding of the things of God. People would know who Adam and Eve was. Not Adam and Steve. They would know who Moses was, who Noah was, because they knew a guy. And then you'd be able to interact with folks and have some sort of common understanding with people. That was lost. And it's now been replaced with a complete misunderstanding. Every, and this is what Satan does. He doesn't just leave a vacuum. He wants to take the beautiful truth of the word and pervert it. To take it to its ugly extreme. And the only voice it seems in the public that will be magnified will be the one that takes that to extreme and ugliness. But can we live our lives out and showing what the beauty of the Lord truly is, what the wisdom and the glory of the Lord can be through a people. It is not an easy task. What does this look like? Please turn to Acts chapter 8. It's a prerequisite that those who would hear the word should understand it. Else it's just empty words or historical events. And this is why there is the exposition here of the Word of God, not merely through the amassing of verses that you may come to understanding, but exactly what does this mean? What is God's intention of this? And you always use Scripture to interpret Scripture, and you bring that understanding. Look, notice how it's lived out here with Philip in Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26. And now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. And in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this gener his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and bringing with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Who is your... Ethiopian. Who's the spirit working on your heart right now to bring that understanding? Because the world is confusing about the truth of God. But can we tell him the good news about Jesus? This is what bringing this understanding is. Not just merely, here's a whole bunch of other information. Let me bring out a chart and show you how this all fits together. It's supposed to first fit together in us, that people would see Christ in us, and that we would be bold enough to talk about that. Think in the public sphere, when the topic of justice is discussed. Can we talk about the greatest injustice against Christ, and how He brings about justice? And one day, Justice shall return unto this earth to right every wrong. You see, everything that is in confusion in the public sphere is answered in Christ. But first, we have to have that understanding how Christ is that answer before we can explain and show how Christ is the answer to those who are in distress, who are angry, who are lost or confused. That's why in verse 8, Nehemiah notes that they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly or distinctly. There must be 
a clear discussion of the word. And most commentators say verse 8 is actually happening now in smaller groups. That you would have the, the public pronunciation from Ezra, and then the Levites would get together in the small groups to bring about that understanding. This is significant for the church of God. There is something, of course, to happen in public worship. But I would say that you're missing something if you're not involved in a small group, biblically. There is something to bring about that understanding. This, this is a monologue. I'm sharing the word and trying to bring about the understanding, much like as Ezra has in this picture. But where does this understanding develop? Not just closing your Bibles and walking out, but taking from this, okay, what did the pastor mean when he said about this? Well, how can we do that? Where, where does this have a bearing in my life? And sure, it has a great opportunity in your family discussions, but also with other believers. Yeah, I've seen that like this, go like that. Or, well, I've seen this problem here. How, how is the word going to relate to that? This is how we are stronger together. This is why we come together as, as a congregational for congregational meetings. Because some people see needs that others don't. But also some see avenues of ministry that others haven't considered. So we are stronger together as we share both that awareness, realizing what we have, and tackling these things together. This is how, this is how God has designed us. And this is how God is seen in the world. That's why in verse 8 here in Nehemiah, they gave the sense... They broke it down because sometimes it can be very overwhelming. And often these troubles do seem crushing beyond more than we can handle. But when we, what happens when there is a problem? You break it down into its elements. Well, I may not be able to solve world hunger, but I can bring some food for my neighbor. I may not be able to open the doors of a closed nation like North Korea or China but I can share the word with my coworker. This is where you break down what seems to be an overwhelming, crushing task into what each of us can do in that sense. This is the purpose here. But I love how one of the great Welsh preachers, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, said about the value of this in preaching, and I quote, What is it that always heralds the dawn of a reformation or of a revival? It is renewed preaching. As that was true in the beginning, as described in the book of Acts, so after the Re Protestant Reformation, Luther, Calvin, Knox, Latimer, Ridley, all of these men were great preachers. In the 17th century, you had exactly the same thing, the great Puritan preachers and others. And in the 18th century, Jonathan Edwards, Whitfield, Wesley's, Rollins, Harris, all were great preachers. It was an era of great preaching. Wherever you get reformation and revival, this is always inevitably the result. May we pray that we might be heralds of this truth. Now finally, in the season of celebration, where God revives His people, we can see this through the celebration itself, verses 9 through 12. So in verse 9, the reading of the law had a deep and profound effect upon the people. Nehemiah, Ezra, and the Levites reminded the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. You see, there, were, there was sorrow because for so long they had been so busy and active and neglected the word. As our text says, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. When they heard and understood God's law, they understood how they fell short of God's holiness. And that's the reason for weeping. This is, this is why devotionally, publicly, in groups, the Word of God is so central because it changes us. It, and it brings about a change that we, through our human efforts, could never think or imagine. And verse 10 notes that they were celebrating the feast by eating and drinking and sending a portion of the food and drink to the poor who did not have the substance to celebrate the feast. And they were sent to their homes to do this as a day of rejoicing. That expression here, eat the fat, means eat the choicest and thus the best, like that meat we had last night. It, 
never mind. So, and I didn't get any. It says here, send portions to the poor. I, I really, never mind. So, it talked about sending portions to the people out of generosity that did not celebrate that. And that's one of the reasons we talk about, for example, what we did last night. And that we then go to those who aren't in that celebration. That we perhaps get together. We bring food to the shut-in. We take somebody out for dinner or lunch who never gets to go out. We just take somebody out for a coffee that just seems to be rushed all the time to say, okay, I'll sit here and listen. Tell me what, what's going on here. This is where we take the celebration that's going on here that it would overflow our walls to a world to hear that. But look back in Deuteronomy 16 of, of that going out, of, of that, that sharing of, of celebration. Because this, in, in essence, is what evangelism is. You're inviting others to share in the celebration Sometimes we become poor evangelists because the celebration isn't happening with us. How do you, how do you become how do you, attractive to the gospel of Christ when it's not seen as attractive to us? It's the overflow of our hearts of joy, of celebration that makes all the difference. Notice, as Moses said in Deuteronomy 16, starting at verse 11. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. That's a great summary of a testimony. That we were, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were a slave to sin. Yet we have been liberated from that bond. And we walk in righteousness to observe what God has commanded us. And we, two things. We do everything in our power to encourage those who are our sons and our daughters. Uh, those who are, are our co-workers to come and celebrate here and worship with us. Yet if they won't. We bring that joy to them. And we, we talk about that celebration of what God is doing. This is what it means. Not only we have times of corporate worship. We have social events like last night. We have community groups. We have Bible studies. We have men's and women's groups. We have other events. And we also seek to reach out to those who do not know us. It's, it's extending that celebration. That's why back in Nehemiah, it says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord. It's, it's how he's impacting here. It's, it's the strength. It's the strength of safety of knowing that you are in God because of the work of Christ. And it's that that joy that's impacting our lives that we are seeking to show to others. In the final element in verses 11 and 12, we see how the, the people cease their grieving over sin and, and are celebrating now. Verse 11, the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And this is the, the quieting of our soul from the word. As we as we have our anxieties, as we have our worries, our frustrations, our troubles, we go to the Word to say, God is still on the throne. He is still our God. He is with us. He will guide us. He is our joy and He is our strength. That our bosses, our frustrations, our families, whatever it might be that's our health that is bothering us, He is going to be our strength when we don't feel that strength. And it becomes a holy day of celebration as Nehemiah concludes in verse 12. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicings because they had understood the words that were declared to them. This is that season of celebration. This is what it means to have lives of worship. That we would go here today to show love and compassion to people. 
that we would be gracious to them as God has been gracious to us. And the Word of God would be so transformative to us, whether it is of weeping, whether it is of shouts of acclamation, or whether it even is in the quietness of peace, of knowing that's, that He is our God. That through the overflow of the joy of what we experience here, that we may seek to bring a revival in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our province, in our country, in our world. But it starts with us. It starts with the revival in our hearts. May that be our prayer, individually. And when that happens, individually amongst the people, it's seen across a congregation and it changes the world. Let's pray. Father, each and every one of us must come to grips with the reality of who you are as found in your word. And as much as we might like to change all kinds of external circumstances, may this word change us first. May we repent of the sin that we have thus far delighted in. May you transform our minds in your truth. May you sure our step as we tend to waver being distracted. May you strengthen us and even embolden us, not to be arrogant or obnoxious, but to be gracious and loving and kind and forgiving as you have been to us. May people see the word impacting our lives and may they hear it from our lips that we might be able to explain and give the sense in a world filled with nonsense. May your, law, your word change us as it changes your world. And this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.